hey, you made it this far in the alphabet. You might as well keep finishing. You've done A through Q. We're on to the R's now. R will be a standalone video probably because there's a lot of R's in it. I mean, maybe I'll put S, but S is big and so is fucking T. So it's big. So we're going to go into this. I'm Ken Finnan. It's my job to get you past the licensing exams. And if you just want to learn the basics of finance terms, follow along on this series and you're going to learn some stuff, I think, and hopefully I'll make you laugh a little bit. So now we're on to R, R. Are you ready, kids? It, who lives in a pineapple under the sea? Yes, that's acid. So I'm going to go with R, R for Randy. R, are you ready? Let's get into it. Okay, so what's a rally? A rally, rally. He's rallying up. When, when, like when a stock goes up quickly, like it's rallying back. If it's down, it's coming back up. It's a quick rise or a rise in either a market or a specific stock. Random walk theory is the idea that historical prices will not affect what's going forward. Like literally, you're walking down the street. It's random. We're not where we're going. So the future price movements are not determined by what happened before. So again, random walk theory is that basically um, we don't believe in technical analysis because technical traders think that if you see support resistance or patterns, it's going to keep going. So random walk theory believes that what happened before has no impact on what's going to happen in the future. Rate covenant. So a rate covenant is part of a revenue bond. You know, the crime C for covenant, R-I-M-E, right? Rate covenant is that we're going to charge. It's a revenue bond that the issuer is or whoever's running the bond is going to charge a high enough revenue rate on the revenue producing project. Wow, that was horrible. But again, the issuer is going to charge a high enough rate to cover the debt service, right? So we have debt service they have to pay. What's debt service? You should have listened to my Ds. That's when um, everyone needs a little D, right? So if we go, if we look at the debt service is what you pay in interest and principal every year. So rate covenant says you have to charge a high enough rate, or we promise to charge a high enough rate to be able to pay that uh, interest and principal every year. Okay, what's a rating? A rating is how they determine credit risk. That's a triple A, double A, A, triple B, or the that's S&P or in Fitch, or Moody's is A, little A, little A, and then A, little A, then big A, and then big B, little A, little A. Those are the credit ratings, and the lower it is, the more the more credit risk you have, right? That's a credit rating or just the rating or the rating companies are the ones doing it. So anything under triple B or BAA under, not those, BBB and BAA are investment grade. Anything under those are considered speculative or junk or high yield. Ratio writing. So a ratio rate is when you, you know what covered call is, right? When you buy stock and sell a call, but what you do is you buy a hundred shares and then you sell one call that matches up. But if the stock has a high beta, you want to kind of match up on that. So if a stock has a high beta, what you're going to do is you're going to say, oh, say it has a beta of two. That's big. If you bought 100 shares, you would sell two calls. Now, the problem with that is you have unlimited risk. It's very aggressive. It's not like covered calls where it's super safe. This actually has unlimited risk because if you buy 100 shares and sell two calls, right, you have one covered call, which is safe, but then you have one naked call, naked, uncovered, risky, right? Okay, so that's ratio writing, and you do that when you are kind of properly hedge a position based on its beta or its volatility. A REIT. What the hell is a REIT? A REIT is a real estate investment trust. It's like a pooled interest. It's like a mutual fund, but it isn't, that manages portfolio. It trades on the, uh, trades on the stock exchange. It could be untraded, but they can trade or not. But the ones we think of, that they're tradable, they're liquid. So you're diversified. Instead of me buying like a property in Miami, Miami, my family makes fun of that. Why I say words, Megan and Miami, maybe it's an M thing. Who knows? Um Instead of me buying one property in Miami and having the risk of that thing, I'll buy a REIT for the entire Miami area. Hope I said it right. Um, the whole Miami area. So this way, I'm diversified. So if one if one property fails, I still have 99 others in this pool. Now remember, I'm not managing it. I'm just buying it like a stock, like a closed end fund in a way. And they invest in property, whether it's you know mutual fund and mortgages or um, whether it's like flipping houses and stuff like that. Not houses. I shouldn't have said that. Flipping commercial property. They don't usually do residential. It's mostly commercial property. Why they don't do residential, I don't know, but it isn't there. So they pass through 90% of their gains. They don't pass through their losses. And it does trade. You can buy it on margin and you can sell it short. But again, it's a pooled investment of real estate and it creates diversification. Real estate limited partnership, or RELP, I sometimes call them, is a limited partnership, which we should know what they are. It's a partnership with a limited partner and a general partner, and they do the same thing. They have central management. They manage multiple properties, but the partnership passes through all the gains and losses. So think, here's a property, and here's the owners. All the money goes in and flows right through 
to all the partners. So that's a limit. That's a partnership. So a real estate limited partnership is one that does that on purpose. Okay. That's what they do that as a partnership. They do specifically real estate. Then there's other ones like oil and gas and stuff like that, which is we probably did already. So there's oil and gas limited partnership, which is oil and drilling and stuff like that. There's equipment leasing, which is they buy, they buy like equipment and then lease it to companies and they make money that way. But then this one is a real estate limited partnership. They do real estate. And that's high level. I'm not going super deep into it. Now, if you see the word raw land, usually it's with this. Raw land, there's no depreciation, no write-offs, no nothing. It's strictly for speculation or capitalization. So if you see raw land, there's no deductions allowed, no depletion, no depreciation. But you're looking specifically for high risk, high reward, speculation or capital, capital gains. What's a realized capital gain or loss? That's when you actually pull the trigger, right? So if you buy stock at 50 and it rises to 60, well, you, you made money, not really. It's an unrealized gain. You can't be taxed on it unless you talk to certain Congress people. They want to do that. But you can't tax unrealized gains. You didn't actually get it yet. So a realized gain is when you bought stock at 50 and it goes to 60 and then you actually sell it and you, and you have a gain that's taxable or a loss. Buy stock at 50, it goes to 40. Until you sell it, you have a paper or unrealized loss. But once you sell it at 40, boom, you lose 10 bucks. And that's a realized gain or a loss. Realized means it's a taxable event. Could be a tax deduction if it's a loss, but if it's a gain, then it's taxable. Recession. What's a recession? So a recession, again, depending who's president or whatever, they, wh whoever's in president will never say they're in a recession until after. It doesn't matter right or left. Um, a recession is technically, according to this, two quarters of negative GDP growth. A depression is six quarters of it. Real property as opposed to personal property. Real property is like real estate. Personal property is like, your, your actual stuff, like your your cars, your desks, your computer, stuff like that. Real property is like real estate building, stuff like that. Record date. So we have the record date is Thursday. Settlement is normally T plus two. So you have to buy the stock by Tuesday or before. That's the coom date. I'm not spelling that. Two, two days before, because then you'll settle on the record date and you'll get the dividend. If you buy it the day before the record date, you will settle after the record date and you will not get the dividend. I always try to picture myself as like the transfer agent or the payee agent at the end of the record day on that day, say it's a Thursday, a Thursday, they look at the list and she, he or she goes, okay, these people are on the list, they get the dividend. If they're not on the list, they don't get the dividend. So the record date is a day you must be an owner of record to receive some sort of distribution. Real time reporting system. Okay. Real time reporting system. That's the way muni bonds are reported for trades when you do a trade in a muni bond you use the rtrs real-time reporting system um the other one for corporates and treasuries is called trace t-r-a-c-e they both they take 15 minutes to just to um report it but from the execution but rtrs is for munis and then trace is for corporates and treasuries recapture recapture is not a good thing it's if you take a deduction and the IRS goes nope we want it back so they're recapturing that so recapture is not a good thing. Recapture is like you took too many deductions and the IRS goes, eh, we want that back. A receivership. A receivership is when you when there's bankruptcy and the court court quit, the court appoints someone to manage the affairs of the business. So if like if you go into bankruptcy and you don't have a, they'll name a, a receiver. It'll go into receivership, they'll name some sort of administrator to look over that, like a trustee, to um to look over that and decide how to sell the money, how to sell the money, how to sell the assets. Okay, reclamation. Reclamation is, you know what settlement is? It's like we actually, the broker dealer on, literally they love to fight when I'm doing this. Not really fighting their play. Um, reclamation is if I do a trade and I'm the one broker dealer, you're the other, and we compare the trade and it locked in. And then I go, oh my God, it's a mistake. I shouldn't have accepted the trade. I shouldn't have settled it or cleared it because the numbers don't work. I'm going to go back into the sim system and reclaim it and say, hey, listen, that's we should not have accepted that trade. Whether it's wrong or non-deliverable, I reclaim it and go, I shouldn't have done that. Recourse loan and non-recourse loan. Well, I'll do them both. A non-recourse loan is when you loan money to a limited partnership as part of your investment and you don't owe the money. If the firm, if the partnership fails, you don't actually owe the money. A recourse loan means that you do owe it. So if you do a recourse loan into a limited partnership, and the partnership fails, you still owe the money. But then that that recourse loan does count toward your cost basis. So it affects it's all the basis. It affects how much you can you know take off in losses and how much you earn and what your percentage is. So a recourse loan means that you owe the money still, even if the partnership fails. And a non-recourse loan means that if the partnership fails, you don't owe the money.
Okay, redemption. Redemption, redeemable securities. We'll go both. So redeemable security is like a mutual fund or a UIT, stuff like that, okay? Now, they're redeemed back to the issuer. Like mutual funds, UITs, I guess annuities, if you want to say, but no, let's just go with UITs and mutual funds. They're redeemed back, or even like the Series EE things, right? So you re you don't sell them in the market. Things are either negotiable or redeemable, okay? Redeemable means like a coupon, you give it back to the issuer and you get your principal back. That's what that is, okay? Um, negotiable means you trade it. If you want to get rid of it, you have to find a buyer. So redemption is the act of returning it to the issuer and getting your principal back or whatever you're, or whatever you're supposed to get back. And redeemable just means that you can do that. Refunding. Refunding. Refunding is lit. Now, a refund is like what I don't do. If you cancel a lesson, I don't refund you. But a refund is when I say I'm an issuer and I have a bond at 8%. And rates drop to like 5 or 4%. I don't want to pay the 8 anymore. So I'll issue a new bond at the lower rate and then take that money and pay you off. That's refunding. Unlike pre-refunding is when you, I think I covered this pre-refunding is the same situation, but I can't call it back yet. So I will issue a bond at a lower rate anyway, buy treasuries, use that money to buy treasuries, okay, that I got from issuing the bond, buy the treasuries, and the interest from those treasuries will pay off the interest on the older bond. It's kind of a accounting loophole. Redemption fee. A redemption fee is like when you buy a class B shares, or even if you get a share, shares of a mutual fund and you leave sort of early, they can charge you a redemption fee. So like, especially in class B, if you sell it within the first five to seven years, you're probably going to pay some sort of redemption fee. But usually if you hold it for long enough, they waive it. But if you're under that numbers, you're going to have to pay a fee. Red herring. What's a red herring? Red herring is a preliminary prospectus. What and you can give that out during the cooling off period of a registered security, non-exempt security. You give that out to get indications of interest. What's missing from it? It can't have a final date or a final price. Because God forbid you saying you're going to be there. Remember, if you're doing this before the SEC has declared you effective, so you can't be like, hey, it's going to be printed this day and this price, because that's assuming the SEC is going to approve you. No, they don't approve. They declare you effective. Remember, no regulator ever approves anything ever. So a red herring is a prelim preliminary prospectus that you push out to get in, um, investors interested and that you can get an indication of interest. It's not, you know, it's not an offer for sale. It actually say on it. This is not an offer for sale. Offers can only be made through prospectus, which is the final prospectus. Registered. Okay. So registered means you're either registered um, with the under the SEC or some sort of state. Uh, any You're registering the security with either a state or the SEC. Registered certificate. So that's registered. That's non-exempt securities have to register with the SEC or the state they're going to do business in. Okay. They're exemptions. If they're non-exempt, they have to do it. If they're exempt, they may not have to do it. A registered security means that you're that basically um, your name is registered on the books of the issuer. So the issuer knows who you are. You buy the shares, the issuer knows who you are. That's what it is. An ROP, the registered option principle. It's the they supervise reps with option uh, options accounts. Okay. So again, they handle the they sign the advertising, they approve the new accounts. The ROP, or the series four, the registered options principle. Is the individual, it's not a firm, it's the individual that supervises options activities and they open accounts and they check the uh, advertising and all that stuff. Registered rep, that's what you're going to be after you pass these exams. That's an individual that is registered with FINRA and any, I guess any state they do business in, they'd be an agent, but a registered rep is an employee of a member firm. Member firm always means FINRA firm, right? Okay. And they're registered with FINRA and their firm, okay? And they are basically serving customers. They're giving advice, they're facilitating trades, they're executing transactions or giving advice or impacting with retail customers over securities. Registration by qualification. That's when an issuer registers their shares in one state only, and it's up to the administrator to decide when they're effective and you file with the administrator only. You're not in more than one state, it's one state only. Once you cross state lines, the Fed wants to be involved. So that would be registered by coordination. Registration by qualification is one state only. Registration by coordination is when it's multiple states, but you're not federally covered because you're going to register both the SEC and all the states you're in. Literally, if you cross the state line, the, uh, the SEC or the federal government has jurisdiction. So you're going to register with the states, more than one state, and the SEC. So you're coordinating between the SEC and the state, 
And you are effective when the SEC says you are, not when the state does. Registration statement, that is absolutely the legal document that's called the S-1. Well, on the federal level, it's an S-1 where you file it. That starts the 20-day cooling off period. And that's it. A registrar is usually a bank or a trust company that's job it is to make to make sure that the record of the owners of corporation securities are right. They they're like, think of the transfer agent as the one who handles it, changing the names. The registrar is looking over their shoulder, going, No, 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 you missed a name. The registrar is like the boss of the transfer agent. The transfer agent is is changing all the names on the regist on the list of securities owners, and the registrar is making sure that they do that. That's their job. Okay, a regressive tra- tax as opposed to a progressive. Progressive tax means that the more you make, the more they take. That's normally like the way income tax go, right? If you make 30 grand a year, you're going to pay this. If you make 50, you're going to pay that a little bit more. And if you pay 100 or more, you're going to pay even more. Now, remember, it's graduated. So it's not like if you make 100, you pay that higher rate on everything. You Everything over the threshold you pay, I've done videos on these. A regressive tax is like a sales tax, okay? So it hurts the poor people more. I just like to say it that way. So progressive affects more the richer people more within reason. And a regressive tax hurts poor people more. That's why whenever they um, try to increase the fare on the subway, they say that's a tax on the poor people. Because think about it. If you're making 15 bucks an hour and they raise the rate from the subway ride from 2 to $3, that's an extra $2 a day. That's that's a chunk of your hourly rate. And not every day, but it is what it is. But if you make you know 300 grand a year, really an extra $2 a day isn't going to impact you. So a, a regressive tax hurts poor people more than rich people. Regular way settlement. Regular way settlement is pretty much T plus two. Everything settles T plus two, except for two things, right? Okay. So everything settles T plus two, except for two things. So so a cash settlement isn't really a thing. Cash settlement is a type of settlement, but no securities trade cash. It's you choose to trade cash, which is the same day. So regular way settlement is T plus two. The two things that are not T plus two are option trading and treasury trading. Those things are T plus one. And then actually, even if you exercise an equity option, it's T plus two. Because think about it, when you buy a call or a put on a stock and you exercise it, you're buying or selling the stock, which brings us back to T plus two. But if you do an index option or non-equity option, it's T plus two trading and T plus two exercise. Regulated investment company. That is an investment company that's subject under subchapter M of the Investment Company Act of 40. Blow my head off of this stupid shit. Um, so boring. And they, they're they regulated if they are regulated under subchapter term as long as they distribute 90, the mutual funds and REITs, okay? They do both do these, even though REITs aren't part of the investment company after 40. They are regulated under subchapter M of the IRS code that says if they distribute at least 90% of their income, net income really, but just income, then they only pay tax on what they don't. So the investors actually get more money because they're getting it hasn't been taxed. They owe tax on it. But that has not been taxed yet. Unlike a corporation, when they earn money, they pay taxes on everything. Then they kick out a dividend and then you pay tax on it. So it's double tax. Okay, Regulation A, small issue or Regulation A plus, really. Regulation A plus is up to, there's tier one up to 20 million and tier two is up to 75 million in a 12 month period. Don't have to go too deep on it. Just know that. Now it's still sort of registered. It's just light registered and anyone can buy them, especially Reg A tier one, anyone can buy, right? Tier two, anyone can buy. But if you're not accredited, then you can't buy as much. You're limited what you can buy. Well, I'm going to go out of order first. Reg D, I'm going to go out of order a little bit, then I'll go back to Reg BI. Reg D is like, I think, D for direct. I think Reg A, S, M, A, L, L, like small, small issuer. Reg D is for direct, so it's a private placement. That's the whole private placement where we don't register with the SEC. We're exempt. We're just selling to kind of rich people, accredited, right? We know what accredited people are because you watch my letter A video, right? Um. So, so you can only sell to accredited investors and it, there's different levels, but the most you could ever, like if it's 504, you can sell to anyone you want. That's under $10 million, 5 million and more. If it's a 506B, you can sell to all accredited, but only up to 35 non-accredited. And if it's a 506C, which is the big one, um, it's still 5 million and more, but it's the highest level. Um, you can only sell to accredited near, no unaccredited, but you're allowed to put general ads out there. And the reason is, is that if you... If only a creditor can buy, even if grandma reads it, she can't buy shit. So that's why they don't mind general advertising. Reg BI is reg reg BI is all about best interest. It used to be the broker dealers used to have just the level of you need to be suitable. Now reg BI means you have to do what's right for the customer. You have to do what's best for the customer, even 
if it's going to hurt you. And you have to identify and confirm all kind of po uh, possible potential, not possible in every conflict of interest, but any kind of potential conflict of interest. And, and you have to make sure that you're doing what's best for the client ahead of your needs. I have videos on this. Regulation FD, it's about fair disclosure. So if, I, if I'm if I'm the CEO and I'm at a lunch with a bunch of analysts and I blurt out something by mistake that's inside or not public, I have to make sure I push that out as a public statement to everyone because all those analysts and investors now who've heard me blurt that not to the public are now in possession of inside information. So to protect them, I have to disclose it out there. The other thing is, they don't want me giving special information to just like my biggest investors and analysts. I'm sure it still happens, but the point of Reg FD is they say fair disclosure. If you're going to tell one person, you have to make it available to everyone. Reg T. Reg T is that whole margin that's written by the Federal Reserve. So actually, Reg T has to do with any time the broker dealer deals with the customers, okay? Anytime broker dealers deal with the customers in the form of money, Reg T comes into play. So there's two ways. One, Whenever you buy shares, we know that settlement is T plus two, but that's when the broker dealers settle. Reg T settlement is actually T plus four. That's when you, the customer, have to have the money into the broker dealer or you or your account gets frozen if you don't get an extension. Okay. So that's reg T. That's one part of reg T. The other part of reg T is from margin that they want fit, they want at least 50% down. So, so the loan value of stock is 50%. So if you want to buy a hundred thousand dollars worth of stock, you have to put down 50%. That's the reg T. And any and now here's the thing. So on Reg T is always 50% of the market value. So if your equity is more than Reg T, they actually let you borrow the extras, like a mortgage, like a home equity loan. I have all margin videos on that. Again, this is high level stuff. Okay. Okay. Reg M, M is in Mary. Reg M. It prevents people involved in a secondary. So it's a secondary or an additional offering, not an IPO. If you're the underwriter or the syndicate member or you're or the issuer and you're part of a additional offering a follow-on, there are restrictions. I'm going to do a whole video on this at some point uh, on what they can do. They cannot buy the shares during the restricted period before, depending on how big the company is. It's either zero days or one day or five days before the pricing day. Because think about it. If I place a bunch of buy orders right before it's priced, I'm going to push the price up and that's not good. And that would be, that would like an issuer or an underwriter would like to do that if they could, to push the price up, they make more money. So Reg M is preventing people involved in a deal of a, a, a follow-on or a secondary additional offering to push the price up to manipulate the price. Reg M for manipulation. But it's not for IPOs. Reg NMS is a system in place to give non-discriminatory access to bids and offers to get the best price. That's the theory behind it. The theory is to make sure that everyone can access the best price, the best bid, best offer, whatever it is, fairly. Regulation S, as in SAM, is offshore. That's ish, It's a U.S. company issuing shares in another country. That's all it is. It's Reg S, so this way they're exempt from registration, right? So Reg A is, is sort of registering a light registration light with the SEC. Reg D is not registering. Rule 147, which is only one state, is um, not registered with the SEC. Reg S is issued in another country. So it's not registered with the SEC as long as it stays out of the U.S. for at least a year. There are exceptions where it could be six months. So if it's equity, it's a year. If it's a reporting company in the U.S., then it's only six months. And then if it's a um, if it's a bond, it's only forty days because nobody gives a shit about bonds. But again, you're issuing securities in another country. Only non-residents can buy, other than freaking Quibs. Quibs can do whatever the hell they want. Um, you're issuing it outside the country and it can't come back into the U.S. for pretty much a year. Reg show. Reg show is all the rules that uh, under the SEC for short selling. Like you have to get a borrow or a locate. You, um, if there's a circuit breaker, you can't sell on a down tick. You can only sell on a plus tick or plus bid. There's all videos all over the place for stuff like that. But reg show is the regulations regarding shorting of securities. You have to get a locate or a borrow and the rules on that and when they can do a buy-in and stuff like that. Reg SP, I always think of super privacy. Reg SP is a federal regula regulation covering privacy of customer information. And what you and Reg SP says you have to tell them what you're going to distribute to other people. And the, and the investor or the customer has to be able to opt out of it very easily. You can't make them like write an email. You can you basically they can opt out of it and say, I don't want you sharing any of my information. They can say that. It has to be a, a very easy opt out. Regulatory risk is the risk 
that regulations may negatively affect the operation. So like if you're a if you're a pharmaceutical company and you have a drug that you're waiting to see if it's um going to be approved or not, that's regulatory risk. But if you're like a limited partnership, I'm just saying regulate regulatory risk is like there's going to be a ruling, okay? Like some agency is going to make a decision on you based on regulations. Leg just to show legislative risk is that they're going to change the law of the land. Reinvestment risk is only, only, okay? It's only for things that pay you. It's not for zero coupons. It's not for common stock. Like bonds, coupon paying bonds, preferreds. As you're getting paid, what happens? So say you're getting 5% a year. Oh, yeah. You're getting 5 Oh, now it sucks. But 5% a year, and then rates drop to 3 well, you're still getting your five, but what are you going to do with the money you get? You're receiving that money. You're going to have to reinvest it. But the only thing available is that lower rate. So that's reinvestment risk. And again, reinvestment risk is only for things that pay you on a consistent basis. So zero coupons do not have reinvestment risk. Regulatory element. Okay, so regulatory element, there's two kinds of continuing education, regulatory and firm. Okay, regulatory element is what, what FINRA requires. And now it used to be every second anniversary and then every three years now regulatory element is where you, you sign into your finpro account you go online and you take this this annual it's now annual continuing ed and they actually edited it in with the whole mqp program where you get to keep, even if you leave you get to keep your licenses for up to five up to five years as long as you do continuing ed every year that's regulatory element where finra runs it and if you don't do it by the end of the year then your statutory your um what do you call it deficient continuing education deficient ce deficient and then you can't do any business now there's also firm element which i probably talked about it's your firm you know those little modules that you have to do every like three four months oh there's one in aml and one in ethics and one of that that's the firm level and they have to do both so finra requires that you have to do theirs every year and then you have to do the firm element from the firm and the firm does very specific to um like like each firm will have a different list of what they have important so like when I was at the prop trading firm, everything was about front run, not front running, but equity and insider trading and stuff like that. But then I went to the bond shop. It was much more about like markup and markdown and bond trading and, and AML and stuff like that. So you, each firm on the firm element is going to gear it toward what they need. We're on the FINRA is going to gear it to what you're licensed for. That's what kind of stuff you're going to get. Okay. Rejection. Literally my entire life with women. Um, So rejection is when if I send you securities to clear and you go, nope. They're not good delivery. I'm rejecting them. If I take them by mistake and I go, I shouldn't have, then I then I reclaim I do reclamation to give them back. But rejection is basically my entire life, or sorry, is um is where I go, you try to deliver shares, and I go, nope, I don't agree with them, or they're not in good delivery form, whatever it is. A remainderman sounds like I mean, it sounds like it sounds like a horror show, right? Remainderman. It sounds like you know, a tall, thin guy in a in the woods or something like that. So the remainderman. Is like so you have a trust and you have a benefit a regular income beneficiary who's getting the money. When when that now what happens is when that beneficiary dies, the remainderman gets it. There's a little nuance to that, but that's pretty much what it is. The remainderman gets their money after the beneficiary of a trust or something dies. Remuneration, literally getting paid for services or work provided. That's all it is. Remuneration is getting paid. Remunerate me, baby. Okay. Um Repo or repurchase agreement. So whoever's doing the buying is doing a repo. So if the Federal Reserve is trying to jump the economy during contraction, they will do repos where they will buy the treasuries from the banks and then the banks will sell them. And then the banks will agree to buy them back with a little bit more, in like two or three days. That's a repo, even the next day. But th that's a repo. So the Federal Reserve is buying in a repo. The Federal Reserve is buying treasuries from the banks to j give them money. They do that during contraction, Okay. And then they get that little bit of they get the money and then they lend it out a much higher rate and then they pay it back um a little bit more. So I'll do this again because I just got confusing. I buy treasuries from you. I you have my money. At say you buy them at 980. You promise to buy them back, you will buy them back for me in two, three days at 980 and at 132nd, say. Okay. Now that little 132nd, that's your interest to me, and that's what you're paying for. But you're going to take that money and lend it out at like eight or nine percent. Because remember, fractional banking, the video I did, says they don't have to have all that money on hand. They just have to have a percent, a fraction of it, and then they can lend this shit out. So a repo is when whoever's doing the buying is doing the repo. So a repo is then the Federal Reserve buys it, and then you are going to rebuy it back for me. A reverse repo is the opposite. We do that during expansion when the economy is expanding. I'm going to sell it to you, 
And then I'm going to buy it back from you a little bit more. So, so I'm taking money away from you. And remember that little bit more interest is so insignificant. It doesn't really matter. You're not making money on that. So that's a repo and a reverse repo. Repos you do during um, contraction and reverse repos the Fed does during expansion. Required minimum distribution. That's the amount that you have to take out. That's not the day. Remember, so usually it's required beginning day is the day you have to start taking your money out. But RMD is a slang for when you have to start taking it out or how much you do. So if you have a qualified retirement account or a regular retirement account, 401k, IRA, stuff like that, once you turn 73, so the April 1st, after you turn 73, you have to start withdrawing money out at a rate that all of it will be distributed by the time you're supposed to kick it, okay? So if they, if you're 73 and they think you're going to live for 10 years, okay? If you're 73 and they think you're going to live for 10 years based on actuaries, you have to take out 10% of your money every year, okay? So that's RMD, and that's going to be every year. Now, the new rules are if you don't take that out, they used to tax you 50%. Now they tax you 25% on what you should have taken out. So if you're supposed to take out 100 grand a year and you only take out 50, they're going to tax you 25% on that 50 that you didn't take out. So take the fucking money out. Okay, reserve requirement. That's what the banks have to have on deposit at any point. So I've done the video and I try to attach it on fractional banking. I can only attach three videos, so I have to pick and choose. But for fractional banking allows banks to just take a portion of what they get in deposits, put it aside, and then lend out the rest. They only have to keep around, it's around 10 or 11% of what, the, the bigger banks have more, but it's usually around 10% of what they get in deposits. And that allows them to grow the uh, economy a little bit because they can lend out and invest 90% of the money that comes in. They only have to keep 10. So that's a reserve requirement. And they usually don't change that too much. 2008, they did with the too big to fail. They're trying to put that on some of the broker dealers now, which is a problem. It's kind of shutting out the small broker dealers, but we'll get there. So again, the reserve requirement is what the Federal Reserve requires banks to keep on deposit. They call them the reserves. It's either cash or treasuries they can use. Resistance, resistance, there's support and resistance. So if you're a technical trader, resistance is like the higher price where it keeps, like there's not a rule that it does. it can go through that. But there's pressure. There'll be downward pressure when it gets up to this this point. Like, look, I'll show you. Hold on. Okay, so the stock is trading in a range that like goes from 50 up to 60, down to 50. So what do you think is going to happen when it gets to 50? It's probably going to rise up. So that's called the support level. The bottom is called support. It's not a hard number. It's just that when it gets down there, people see that, and then they want to buy it. So then they'll push it up. And when it gets up here, they go, oh, it's been hitting 60 a bunch of times. We think it's going to go down. So they start selling it. It puts downward pressure on it. And that's resistance. The upside is resistance. It's stopping you. For, it's resisting your rising. And support is holding it up. So it's, it's probably going to prevent it from going down too much. Now, a breakout is if it goes through that, right? So we think it's going to bounce off of it. But it goes through what we think is going to keep going higher. through the. So through resistance means it's bullish, okay? And you place a buy stop up here. But if you go through support, it's not a good thing. We think it's going to go down again. Because once you get through the floor, you have to go to the next floor before you stop falling. Okay. A restricted security is usually an unregistered non-exempt security, like a Reg D. Usually it's subject to 144 holding period, stuff like that. So pretty much restricted means unregistered non-exempt. Means it has not been registered yet. So there'll usually be some sort of holding period or some restrictions, hey, on selling it. So a respondent, is someone who's been named in an arbitration or disciplinary action. Like if I was in trouble, I'd be the respondent. They're the plaintiff or whatever. They're the ones leading the action. I would be the respondent. I have to respond to it. Restricted account. And a restricted account is a margin account with below 50%, below the reg T, right? The below the 50%. It's not even a big deal. Just when you buy stock, you have to meet the reg T. Nothing happens. You go, I get restricted all the time. I mean, this, I don't know it. I just, I know that I go below 50% because I literally can't pick a good stock to save my fucking life. So if you see residual claim, that's what common stock owners have, right? So if a company goes bankrupt, all the creditors and all that get paid off, whatever's left goes to the common, common stockholder preferred. Well, to be fair, none of it gets there because that's the equity. Residual claim is you get paid after everyone else is paid. Retained earnings. Retained earnings is when a company makes money, the profits, what they or their income, I guess it's better if they, whatever their income is, what they don't pay in dividends. So if we earn a million dollars and we pay out 400,000 in dividends, that's 600,000 in retained earnings. Retained earnings are literally just us, what we don't pay in dividends. Retiring a bond is basically ending the obligation. You either buy it in the open market, you call it, 
or it just matures and you pay it off. Retired bond means we don't care care about it anymore. It's gone. I know I'm going to jump in around. A restricted person is somewhat, because they have like four different databases I'm looking at. So restricted person is a person who pretty much works in a broker dealer or in an industry and cannot buy on I, equity IPOs. Restricted persons, member firms, associated people of member firms, immediate family, employees of member firms, fiduciaries, portfolio managers, and people who own broker dealers, or even lawyers or accountants who do most of their business with broker dealers, they're restricted from buying on equity IPOs. They can buy on additionals. They can buy on additional offerings, follow on, same thing, um, secondaries. They can buy on bond offerings. They can buy on preferred offerings. No one cares, okay? It's literally common stock IPOs they can't buy on because hell, if any, if here's the thing, if people in the business could buy on them, then none of the good deals would ever get out to the public. Return on investment, it's your profit or loss from a transaction, okay? It's an annual, usually maybe it's on as annual, but return on investment is how much you're getting versus your investment. So it's your profit or loss divided by what you invested. It's pretty straightforward. Retail communication. So this is communication to the public that a, that basically makes some sort of investment recommendation or some version of that. Retail. So let's go with the three of them since we're here. Correspondence is to 25 people or less does not need pre-approval. Or if it's over 25 people, in a 30-day period, then it needs pre-approval, and that is retail communication. If it's to institutions like broker dealers, hedge funds, mutual funds, it doesn't need to be pre-approved, it's reviewed. So correspondence and institution are treated the same way as far as whether you have to pre-approve it or not. They will put more restrictions on correspondence if they see something wrong. Institutions can kind of defend themselves, but correspondence is 25 or less, no pre-approval. Retail is over 25, needs pre-approval. And institutions is sending to institutions is does not need pre-approval. Revenue bonds, revenue bonds are bonds that are they're a type of municipal security that is issued for projects that earn revenue. So the revenue from the project pays the debt service, unlike a GO bond where the property taxes or ad valorem taxes pay the debt the debt service, which is interest and principal. So revenue bonds are issued for projects that earn money. And they're they're not corporates, they're a little corporate, but for the most part, they're issued by city, state, town, whatever, and they're there to generate revenue, like a parking garage, a hospital, airport, so like that toll roads. A revenue anticipation note, a RAN, a revenue anticipation note is a short-term uni, is a short-term uni that is used like if we know we need money now and we say, oh, we got tolls and we got subway fares coming over the next few months, we'll issue a muni note now, a revenue anticipation note now to get the money. And then when when we get our revenue, non-tax revenue in the future, it'll pay it off. It's like it's like a bridge loan to get us out of an emergency. If you see the RevDEX or the revenue bond index, that's on the bond buyer. It's like 25 revenue bonds and they just just an index that tracks it. It's a weekly thing, I think. Okay, there's churning and reverse churning. So churning is when you excessively trade, right? But reverse churning is like if you're on a fee-based account, you know you're getting paid regardless. So what you do is you ignore the account. You don't do anything because I'm getting paid. I'm getting, you know, two grand a month from, from assets, no matter whether I move it or not. So I'm not even going to do anything. That's reverse churning. That's just as bad as churning. A reverse split is when when usually it's bad. It's usually not a good thing. A regular split is a sign that the stock is too high, maybe. And it's all marketing tools, but they, they're going to get more shares worth less on a regular split. On a reverse split, you're going to get less shares worth more. They kind of do it to raise the price of it. So like Citicorp did it right after the after the uh, 2008 shit. Um, they, they couldn't get over five bucks a share. So they did a one for 10 reverse split. So that means for every 10 shares you owned, you only got one. But the price went up to 40. It was at $48 by $4.80. It went up to 48. So if you owned 100 shares at $4, you now own 10 shares at 40. So a reverse split is the opposite of a regular split. You're going to get less shares worth more versus a regular split. You're going to get more shares worth less. Even out, everything evens out like market value wise, but it just looks better. They're not marketing. A revocable trust, a revocable trust is a trust that can be canceled or changed by the grantor. The grantor sets it up and they set up either revocable or irrevocable. Revocable means that the person who set it up can cancel it, change it to whatever they want, and it's part of their estate. An irrevocable trust, once you put it in there, 
you, you can set it up and then the trustee handles it based on what the rules are. You cannot take that money back. It is not part of your estate. There are advantages and disadvantages to both. Talk to a lawyer, not me about that shit. I think you already talked about reverse repo. It's when you're selling shares and then you're going to buy it back later at a higher price. A right, also known as a preemptive right, or a right, right hand, okay, or the right wing, whatever you want to call it. A right is when a issue, a, it's very short term, it's like 30 to 45 days, maybe 60, where a company who's issuing more shares, they give the existing shareholders the ability to keep their percentage ownership. They give their shareholders the ability to keep the percentage ownership. They don't have to use the right. But if you own 100 shares, you're going to get 100 rights. Now, you, you may not get 100 shares out of it. You may get 5 or 10, but you get a right to buy shares very short term at a discount from the last sale. So they're very short term. What can you do with it? You can sell it or trade it, same thing. You can give it away. You can um, exercise it, which means buy the more shares to keep your percentage ownership. You let them expire. Moronic, but you can't. You can't give them back to the company. Rights of accumulation. That is literally just, if you have a mutual fund, that allows you to get... so. Rights of accumulation is this. We know what break points are. They get their volume discounts. Can you hear the dogs barking? Volume discount. That's why I look. And I have ADD. I can't look at one thing. So if you have a mutual fund and say they have a, a break point, so every 10 grand, say you get a lower sales charge. Well, if you put in eight grand, you're going to pay the eight and a half percent. But if the value of your fund rises past the 10 grand, then any new money gets the lower sales charge. So say you put in eight grand and it grows over a year or two to 12 grand. You decide to put another 2,000 in. Well, you're now at 12 grand plus the two is 14. You're going to get the lower sales charge. So rights of accumulation allows the growth of the fund to qualify you for a break point. By the way, a rights offering is the same as getting a preemptive right. Risk, it's the potential for loss. That's what it is. There's inflation risk, interest rate risk, default risk political risk, foreign exchange, call, all that shit. Risk adjusted return, it's return adjusted for the market risk associated with it. Like usually it's going to be um, a sharp ratio does that. I think beta does, but it's, it's so it's a risk adjusted return is really just your return adjusted for the risk you're taking. The risk free rate, the risk free rate return is treasury bills. It's usually like the 90 day T-bill. Why? Because short term T-bills don't have any default risk. No inflation risk, or very so little that it doesn't matter. No default, no inflation, no interest rate, no reinvestment, no call risk. So, oh, no political risk because they're short term. They don't really have any rates. And when they talk about risk premium, it's the amount you're earning above that. I like this segue. So, risk free rate is like the 90 day T bill, say it's 4%. If you're earning 7%, you have three points of, of risk premium. Riskless principal transaction. Okay, it's a riskless principal transaction. Normally, a principal transaction is I'm the broker dealer. I own the shares. You come to buy it. I sell it to you out of my inventory with a markup. But I have risk because the market may go up or down while I own the shares. Risk as principal is I don't actually own the shares until you give me the order. So I don't own the shares. You call up and say, I want to buy a thousand shares at you know whatever price. I'll buy the shares and then turn around and sell them to you with a little bit of a markup. So risk as principal, a risk as transaction or simultaneous is where I'm not actually buying or selling the shares or taking a position until I have the order from you. So I don't have risk there unless you run away. Risk tolerance is the basically the investor's ability or willingness to lose their money. Okay, their risk tolerance, they're aggressive, they have high risk tolerance, conservative, they have low. So the younger they are, the more sophisticated they are, the, the more money they have, they can have higher risk tolerance. The older you get, the less risk tolerance you have. So if someone in their 80 or 90s can't have a lot of risk tolerance, they don't have time to run it out. Where somebody at 25 could say, listen, I'm willing to take a chance, put it in there, and hopefully it'll work out over time. Rollover, that's an IRA rollover where you're moving it from one type of account to another. Not like moving it from JP Morgan to Schwab, but like moving it from a 401k to an IRA. And that you can do that once a year. And the best way is do it entity to entity instead of you getting the check. Because then if they take longer than that to take too long, you're not going to have a tax problem. Because if you take the check, if you take it out of one place, take the check and going to deposit it somewhere else, you have 60 days to do it. And they actually hold back some of the shares, some of the money, which is a problem. Deeper level. A Roth IRA is an IRA that is separate. Where you, um, Again, high level. A Roth IRA 
is an IRA that's different than a regular IRA, that the money goes in after tax, it grows tax deferred, but if you hold it for more than five years, and if you take it out in a normal distribution, you pay no taxes on the growth, which is great. There's issues with it, like income limits. If you make too much money, you can't put it in, stuff like that. A Roth 401k is sort of the same thing. Now, they change the rules a little bit. I think I talked about it in a video. A Roth 401k is where you set it up at work, where you can put the money in after tax or gross tax deferred. But previously, they the company had to set up a separate one as a regular 401k to match. Now, I think they change the rules where they can put it in after tax also, and it grows tax-free. It's I Don't hold me to that. Really, let's go with this one. The Roth 401k. You get to you can set the same thing up as a Roth in your own at your firm instead of just with an IRA. And you get to put any money in after tax and it grows tax free. The company will match, and there's other issues with that. A round lot, it's a unit of trading that's a multiple of hundred. So if you want to buy for shares, okay, for common stock, round lot is a hundred shares. So if you buy 80 shares, that's an odd lot. If you buy a hundred or two hundred or three hundred or four hundred or five hundred. That's a round lot. A mixed round lot is like 140, 180, 240. So a round lot is 100 shares. So 100, 200, 300. Rule 144, I'm not going to go deep into it. It's a rule that restricts selling. So if you do restricted shares, it's a six-month holding period. Then you can sell whatever you want, depending on certain things. Well, and then the other one is for control people of any shares. They have to hold. They have no holding period, but they have to follow the 144 rules. They can sell the greater of the 1% of the outstanding the four weeks trading volume, four times a year, which is every 90 days. And then every 90 days, they have to fill out a new form. That's for control people. They have no holding period. They have to follow that their whole life. 144A is an exemption to the holding period for 144. So it allows quibs to buy during that six-month holding period. 145, rule 145, is all about mergers and acquisitions and stock splits and stock dividends and reorganizations. It sets the rules for that. A lot of rules on that. Rule 147 is that you, if you register your shares in only one state to only be sold in one state, then you're exempt from the SEC requirements because you're an intrastate offering because the federal government can't really control what the states do within reason. So rule 147 is for intrastate offering. You can register all in one state. Rule 415 is for shelf offering where a WICSI or a well-known season issuer or a season issuer can do a shelf offering. And they can actually sell the shares for up to three years instead of a normal one year. RMD, RMD, required minimum distribution. That is, if you have a qualified account, qualified retirement account or some version of that, they are going to require you to start taking your money out. It's now 73. It was 72. And now it's 73. You have to take it out at a rate that would, I think I already did this, but you have to take it out at a rate that all of it will be expended by the time you're supposed to die. I definitely did it again. But- Hear it twice. Not gonna hurt. So good. I said it twice. Okay. That's ours, baby. That's the ours. Okay. So Ed, that's a big one that took a while. S is our next. We're gonna go there. Guys, hopefully stay awake during this. And um, I will see you on the other side.